This is Howard Cosell. The name of the show is Speaking of Everything. My guest is Mr. John Lennon, one of the Beatles. You remember the Beatles, who brought a whole new form of musical culture to the United States of America in the early 60s when they debuted on the then-existent variety show known as the Ed Sullivan Show. There have been many vicissitudes in the lives of the four respective Beatles since then, and perhaps none more notable than in the case of our guest today, Mr. John Lennon, who has had a wide variety of troubles and yet continuing artistic successes, all of which we shall begin to discuss with you. It's a joy to have you with us, John. Thank you, Howard. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's great to meet you after seeing you on TV so much. It's a treasured moment for you, isn't it? It is. It's one of the highlights. <laughs> John, let's get right to the heart of your troubles and get those out of the way. The right. continuing apparent attempt by the United States government to, effect, to effectuate your deportation from this country. The whole thing derives from a marijuana count against you in England, doesn't it? Yeah, and during the 60s in England, I may as well do a bit of background on it. Uh, there was a headhunting policeman who was scoring or collecting all the pop stars in England. And uh, he got them by hook or by crook, mostly by crook. He's now in jail. And I was one of his uh, scalps. And uh, I still contend I was planted at the time. I didn't know because I still half believe that it, those things didn't happen. And in, in England, they also had a law that said if you were in a building, if, if some, something was found in your house and you had nothing to do with it, and you were away on holiday, then it was your responsibility. So that's how they got me. And... Uh, it's sort of being used to say that I can't come in. It's like a technical hitch, you know. But the government could drop the case tomorrow. It's just a matter of somebody saying, oh, forget it. Because it doesn't only affect me. There's people that have been here 20 or 30 years, my immigration lawyer told me, that, that have been bust over here since, say, for one joint. And they've tried to throw them out, or have thrown them out. People have lived here most of their lives. They don't know any other country. And they ask you, you know, which country do you want to be deported to? So my case is still up in the air, and once a year they tell me I have 30 days to get out. That was going to be my next question. I've read <clears> on several occasions, this time Lenin has to go, and yet it has not eventuated. Well, that, that, that happens about once a year, or it seems to be once a year, or maybe twice, that they give me 30 days to leave, and then my lawyer appeals it and gives me another few months to try and fight the case. I think uh, the... the the weirdest thing about it is, A, that it ever started, and B, that it's costing the American people a lot of money to try and get rid of me. How did it actually get started? Uh, well, I've, I piece things together the same as anybody else, you know, and there was an article by Jack Anderson that sort of astounded me, you know. I mean, I thought something was going on, but I was really astounded. And it seems to have started by a Senator Thurmbold or somebody... Strom Thurmond, yeah, perhaps. Yeah, that, that's the From one. South Carolina, yeah, yes. Sounds like something that happens to you in old age. So. I've got Strom Thurmond in my arm. <laughs> well, he, <laughs> well, Many people had, have. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, I seem to have got him in my arm, too. Uh, apparently, according to the things that I've read, and I, I don't know for sure either because I'm no detective, but he sent a letter to somebody sort of suggesting that they shouldn't allow me to stay. And it really stemmed from an article in the Rolling Stone which said that I was going down to San Diego for the Republican Convention, which, is, which A, it wasn't true, because nothing was confirmed. There was nothing set. And it all started after that. And then next minute I knew they were telling me to leave. And I said, why? What for? And it's been going on for three years. I've been living in New York for three years. And I'm still here. And... Uh, I don't intend to go because I just think it's wrong, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I love it here and uh, they're not sending me back to Siberia. <laughs> you don't care for England? I like England, it's my home, I like England, Scotland and Wales and Ireland, you know, I, li I like the country, it's, it's going to be there, it's not going to go anywhere, you know, but uh, it's good to be in America, it's the centre of the world as far as I'm concerned, and this is where the music came from that influenced me as a child. And we had all the Doris Day movies and the things, and the Heinz Beans. We all thought they were English, but, you know, we were like a 59th state in Britain. And uh, I was brought up on Americana, and I feel comfortable and at home here. It's no secret that you've smoked joints in your time. No, it's no secret at all, you know. And uh, the, only, the only strange thing about it is the time when they bust me, I wasn't smoking. 
I wasn't doing anything. So uh, maybe that's the way the cookie crumbles, you know. I mean, at one period, people had it just out, out in the houses. I think they still do, you know, just like uh, drink. And you'd go around for if people's had, they said, do you want to join? Yes, no, depending on how you felt. It was pretty open. And the only time I didn't have it is when they planted me. There was a, a question in the House of Lords or Parliament about it, because they used 15 men and two dogs to arrest me, you know? Really? Yeah, yeah, and there was a question about what, why they spent so much just to arrest me. Mm -hmm. They only had two dogs at the time. I just want to spend another minute or two on your case and then get to, to music, to your career, the career of your former colleagues, and in some respects still. <coughs> you had wanted the man who originally prosecuted you, mm. the particular prosecutor, plus the chief immigration officer, your attorney had wanted them as witnesses for you in a more contemporary proceeding, isn't that so? Yeah, uh, that was about three or four weeks ago. The, we were in court, and I, I follow what my lawyer does. You know, I don't tell him what to do, so he informs me. And he said he was trying to bring in the ex-prosecution counsel, uh, Mr. Shiano, and the ex-head of Immigration New York, to ask them a few questions, because he has reason to believe that certain letters and instructions were sent from Washington to the ex-prosecution counsel, but the judge turned us down on that, says we can't use them, as we, we can't interview them, in fact. And uh, What was presumed to be in those letters? That well, see, the whole point was, was the, I'm sorry, uh, the whole point was, when it started, it, the immigration people were adamant that it was their own local decision and it was a technicality that it's unfortunate, but nothing can be done, it's the law. And all the time we disclaimed that and said, no, we think this, it, the, the, the instructions are coming from Washington. That was a gut reaction. It, we, we didn't believe that it was just a local case and they were just treating me the same as any other person, you know, when murderers and rapists are allowed in and heroin dealers and the biggest dealer in the world is allowed in, who's not an American. And uh, millions of cases which we have on file of people being let in, well, that's an exaggeration. And we contended that they were getting instructions from somewhere else, and they contended not. And it t turned out subsequently that we were right. But now we can't, they won't let us get at the people who would be honest about it, because they have no axe to grind. But we can't, we're not allowed to talk to them. So the thing hangs heavy over your head, and it's, uh, it must be a very difficult process of living for you, loving the country, as you've already described it knowing that the prosecution continues. Yeah, I try and forget about it, and I try and keep my head buried in my work. But there was a period, about 18 months ago, it was really beginning to get to me, because it just wouldn't go away. It's like a fly, only worse than a fly, but it's like something that just won't go away, you know. And then you forget all about it, and I think, oh, it must be all right, the lawyer hasn't called me for a bit. And then suddenly, I was in the middle of making an album, this the out now, walls and bridges, ha <laughs> ha. And uh, <laughs> on what label? On Apple Capital label at your local store. And I was in the taxi cab going to the record plant where I make the records in New York. And it came over the air. John Lennon has 30 days to get out. So I just jokingly said to the cabman, OK, drive me to the airport. Because nobody had told me that, that my own people hadn't told me because they didn't want to interfere with me working. So I usually get to hear about things in the paper, like 30 days. I, I usually read about it afterwards. And it's, it's like somebody continually punching you in the kidneys. You know, it began to wear me out, but I decided, forget it, I'm going to pretend it's not happening. And I'm just acting as if nothing's going on, I just live here and that's it. And in my head, that's how I feel. I live here and that's all there is to it. As I introduced you, and our guest is, of course, John Lennon, at the top of the show, I said that the Beatles brought an original form of musical culture to the United States in the early 60s. You nodded your head in acquiescence. Now, in retrospect, what do you deem your contribution to have been? How would you describe or define the kind of art form you brought? I think uh, along with, as a direct result of rock and roll, that means Bill Haley and Elvis Presley, although Elvis Presley was the main influence. We were, oh, people always said we were leading the 60s, you know, and changing everybody's hair and that. And we were standing up there looking different, but we were reflecting what was going on on the streets in, in England and, in, and here too. 
Well, well, the hair thing started in England. And what we really were were figureheads for what was going on. So I never really claimed... I cl we changed something, I'm not quite sure what it was, but we represented a change rather than were the instigators of the change. If whatever we wore was already on the street, we would just see it in a shop, buy it, or have it remade and go on stage with it. Mm -hmm. The haircuts just sort of happened almost. The longer hair now, which all the footballers have, right? And uh, it's just good, all the footballers. Yeah, Very they good. do. They look like, uh, most of them look like, you know, they have 60s kind of haircuts, you know? I think it'd be unfunctional to have it any longer for them. But uh, we, we were just sort of part of the scene, but we were the figureheads, you know? We were the masthead on the boat. The boat was going on it of its own accord, mm -hmm. and we were just that thing stuck on the front. So I couldn't say what, what we contributed, you know? Uh, they say we changed the music, but we used the music that was already there. You can take half our melodies and do them in a 20 style. So it's hard to put your finger on what the change was. Maybe we were part of a movement where heroes were no longer from the upper classes, especially in Britain. You couldn't even get in a, in a British movie unless you'd been to Oxford or something. I mean, it was ridiculous. And the same kind of things was happening in movies as was happening in music, which is people sort of ordinary people were getting a chance to get break in. It wasn't so bad in America because they weren't so class conscious about accents and things. But before us, anybody from Liverpool, if they, a lot of comedians came out of Liverpool, they couldn't, they would have to change their voice. They would never get in a movie or on the radio if they spoke naturally. So we were part of that movement, which is people being themselves in extraordinary situations. And God bless us all, so serious. Mm -hmm. Well, you say you reflected what was then taking place in the society. Being a reflection, were you astonished, you and Ringo and George, by the overwhelming reaction to you here in the States? Yeah, we were, all, we were more astonished. We, we sort of knew what we were doing a bit in Britain, although even that astonished us. The, the real, the most amazing thing was making it in America because we thought they'll never, they'll never like what we almost thought was imitation American music, which we were trying to do. And that was astonishing. But I always said that we were like in the eye of the hurricane. So we were just in this little goldfish bowl in the middle and one didn't really have time to think what was going on. It was just going on so fast. You just had to keep your eye on the road. That was about all you could do. Looking back at it, it is, it's astonishing that I was part of it. I was one of those things that happened, like an Al Jolson or something. You know, it's already looking like history. It is, it's 10 years ago, nearly. Hmm. And it's a strange feeling to look back on it. Oh, I was right in that. You know, that's about all I can, how, the only way I can deal with it. Accepting then, John, the fact that you and your colleagues, your associates, brought a new form of musical culture to the United States, whether by way of reflection of what was happening in the streets or otherwise, whom else in the past would you say were the initiators of a new form of musical culture that you would liken yourselves to? Well, I could, I'm more likely to just, I don't know about the musical culture bit. They say these phenomena, which is, I suppose, what we were, happen every ten years or so. We were, there was ten years between us and Presley, and apparently there was ten years between Presley and Sinatra. So you would, you would say Sinatra and Presley? Yeah, and, and possibly of... Bing, and, and, but it's almost more like uh, we were the rock and roll period, which was a ten year span of birth and formation into different kinds of music. Now, and Bob that Dylan... Was the jazz period. Bob Dylan was basically a contemporary of you fellows. Yeah, he virtually made it around the same time as so 64, 65. When would you say his fame became international, like yours? Uh, he got international probably around about 65, 66, when he went rock and roll. Because mm -hmm. before that he was straight folk, as it were. And he was Woody Guthrie incarnated. Would you characterize him as a phenomenon? Oh, yeah. Uh, he's, he's a phenomenon, yeah, sure. When was the last time the four of you were together? Uh, must have been at least three or four years ago. I've been in America for three years. I don't think I've seen... I've seen George over here once. That's three years ago. So it must be three or four years. Paul, Ringo and I were in Los Angeles about six months ago together. Mm -hmm. Paul was in New York three months ago. I was in L.A. with Ringo two months ago. George is on his way over to start his tour. <coughs> I'll go and see him, folks. And I'll probably see him before or after the tour. I'm th almost thinking after because he'll be so 
wound up before the tour. Obviously, it's very difficult for you all to be together, even if only in the light of your own difficulties. And well, yeah, because going it, into uh, and out of this country. Yeah, because George and Paul also had a little problem with the dreaded devil weed, and mm -hmm. uh, they have trouble getting in and out of the country. Mm -hmm. But they, if you apply eight like eight months in advance, you might get in. Do you think there's any possibility giving? way to the concession of possible legal clearances of the four of you ever working together again. Yeah, I think it's quite possible because uh, there'd be no reason not to. I know whether we do live performances is another matter. That, that, that's a whole ball game. But it's quite feasible that we'd make records together because I've worked with Ringo. I've worked with Ringo and George. I've worked... I have, the only one I haven't worked with since the breakup is Paul. And uh, we, I've worked with Elton John, I've worked with Harry Nielsen, we all work with lots of other artists, so why, why not each other? It's quite possible. There is a remaining and enduring affection between and among you. Yeah, we, we went through a sort of divorce pangs period where we were all a bit uptight with each other. And I think it was mainly... Why? I think it was mainly, looking back on it, uh, from my own part, it was mainly fear, even though I wanted the Beatles thing to end. Just, I felt as though I couldn't breathe if it went on any longer. And also it was sort of dying, you know. Do you think it was smothering you individually? Yeah, it was that, and we were no longer enjoying it. And the, the, all through it, we really did enjoy it. There were lots of messing and times we were, hated it, but basically we did it because we liked it. The, the, the rewards were as a sort of bonus. We wanted to be musicians, we liked working together. It got boring, and I think we went through a little trauma of divorce because of it was scary after being with people for 10 years suddenly to be out on your own. It's so cool saying, I want to leave you to anybody that you've been with for a long time. And then suddenly you're out on your own. And I think we've all adjusted to that. We're all doing well with our records, so that makes us confident enough to relax about it. Mm -hmm. And I think we've all established ourselves as individuals now. And uh, so that's all over, and we are good friends. And Whenever we meet, we spend a lot of time over a bottle of wine reminiscing, you know. Remember when we were in so-and-so and that girl jumped on your head. Yeah, remember this, remember that. So mm -hmm. We're quite happy about it. What have been your most recent works? Uh, Walls and Bridges, album out now. Which you mentioned. Well, yeah. Did I mention that? Oh, yes. And uh, there's a single from it out now, which is Whatever Gets You Through the Night, featuring Elton John on piano and vocal harmony. And I just finished that album. It took me six weeks which is pretty good going. And I'm now back in the studio working with some tapes that I started in 73 with Phil Spector. And uh, I'm just getting that ready for maybe January. But you have complete individual confidence now, as you indicated in, a, in an earlier sentence. Yeah, yeah. I think it, it was just that feeling of suddenly being on your own after having other people to lean on. Mm -hmm. We're all leaning on each other for a long time, and I think it was good that we separated sort of found our way around a bit. Now, you talked earlier about the music of the 60s. We are in the music of the 70s. How would you characterize that music uh, differentially from the 60s? Well, I think um, a seed was planted in the 50s by the early rock and rollers. It became a young tree in the 60s, and now it's sort of branching out into all different forms, but the seeds were already there in the 60s and the 50s. And now you're just getting variations. It's a bit like jazz, I, I, although I don't know a lot about jazz, early jazz. I do know that it started out as one form. Then it got di a little more diverse, a little more complicated. You've got your avant-garde, you've got your traditional, you've got your blues. You've got all these different fields of jazz, and I think that's what's happening to rock and roll. And it's almost killing it as well, because I think jazz got a little throttled by intellectualism. And it's an interesting statement. You said it's almost killing it as well. I think jazz got a little throttled by intellectualism. Is that a vocal implication that intellectualism is throttling contemporary music? Yeah, I'm partly to blame myself as well. It's sometimes take too much thinking about the music and discussing it and not doing it. And I think it seems to happen to all forms of art or culture, even sport, not even sport, everything. We, what we seem to do is we have something, and then we refine it, and we refine it, and we refine it till it's no longer resembling what it started out to be. And it has its own set following, but it loses some kind of natural spirit to it. 
and uh, I think rock and roll has that started a few years back and it's still happening I don't think it'll kill it for good I think it's a kind of music that'll be around there'll be jazz there'll be rock and roll there'll always be that kind of music but I think it's in danger of taking itself too seriously what is your feeling about those who object to <clears throat> so many of the lyrics extant today I think uh, I understand them but uh, most of us you quite a lot of us anyway use four-letter words you know I know most men do usually they don't when women around which is some kind of or, I, it's hypocritical really but it depends you know who the woman is and I think uh, that kind of thing is the same kind of thing that used to ban books you know words can't kill you and people that banned words in books it didn't stop people buying those books the books were smuggled in if you couldn't buy Henry Miller in the in the early 60s you could go to Paris in England we used to go to Paris and everybody would buy Henry Miller books because they were banned and everybody saw them all the students had them and I think if they <clears throat> if there is a problem with lyrics and words of records I think then they should have like they do on TV saying on this show this radio show we're gonna have a few lyrics that might upset people so don't listen to this show because I think we, we should be able to express ourselves Without, uh, as long as we don't harm anybody. I mm -hmm. And I don't believe words can harm you. You've fallen prey to those charges to some extent, haven't you? Yeah, I had a record a few years back called Woman is the Nigger of the World. And uh, a, a lot of stations wouldn't play it because they said their black listeners objected to the word nigger. But actually it was mainly white people that objected to it. You know, it's a sort of, it's a tricky uh, psychology there. And of course now that one could probably get away with it this is only three years ago and I have had a, a record of the word C-H-R-I-S-T which we're still not allowed to say on there they always say superstar mm -hmm. that film on the record which is, is extraordinary <laughs> and words like that you know everyday words and uh, I, th I think it's ridiculous and it is changing and nobody can stop it it's like something that has to happen and people are trying to hold it back like trying to King Canute trying to hold back the tide I want to get back to your earlier discussion, which I found most interesting, this subject of throttling with intellectualism, because you threw in an almost parenthetical aside. You said, I myself am guilty of that. Hmm. How are you guilty of that? Because uh, I, I, there was a period, and I can't put my finger on it, when I was trying and thinking so hard about the music that it wasn't spontaneous spontaneous anymore it didn't have any life in it I'm not saying it went on for a long period but I found myself treating it differently from the way I treated it all my life which mm -hmm. is just music and I get into it and like it or don't like it and I started looking at it too much as a quotes unquote art form and, and even with the lyrics and it was limiting what I could do you know I would say well, I'm not going to use that cliche I'm not going to use that cliché musically or lyrically because of this, that, and the other. And by the time I discussed it, I'd limited my whole range of composition about what I could use. I was becoming a musical snob, which I was always down on other people for being like that. You feel you're out of that motif now? Yeah, oh, definitely. You know? How do you know? Because um, I can feel it in, in the music and my attitude to it. I can also feel if you hear my new album walls and bridges out now <laughs> on an can, apple cap on an apple yeah. capital label in your <laughs> local store yeah th it, there's no there's no I, I allowed myself to go in any direction i wanted meaning it's a it's a sort of hodgepodge of different kinds of music and some of it's very poppy some of it's bluesy and there's no limit to it i have not limited myself by trying to say oh i've done that before therefore i won't do it this has been done by so-and-so artist, therefore I won't do it, it's not original. I've just gone back to making music that I like. All right, so you're not now involved with what you earlier termed a refinement and a re-refinement. What then can be your new contributions to the musical culture? I think uh, my greatest pleasure is writing a song, words and lyrics, that will last longer than a couple of years and if I get one out of 20 or 30 songs that anybody could sing from Frank Sinatra to Tiny Tim mm -hmm. 
then that's my greatest feeling is to do one a piece of work like that and that happens rarely and uh, that happened in the case of the Beatles yes we, we got a few out and I've done a few myself since we split up songs that will outlive me probably and that that gives me my greatest pleasure and therefore the musical style doesn't matter the basic thing is still the song itself and uh, that's where I get my kicks that's where you get your kicks. That's yeah. the whole of your life, the fullness well, of your life. Well, <laughs> no, no, I mean, there is, there is sex and fun, you know? Mm -hmm. But uh, creatively, at, at the moment, I, it's still that feeling of always trying to make either the perfect record or the perfect song. And I know it's impossible, but that's the thing that keeps you going. I guess in sport, it'd be the perfect play. Do you yeah. think you can ever be happy in marriage? Uh, I, uh, the happy is a broad word. You mm -hmm. know? I, could, I don't think anybody can be totally happy in anything. I take happiness when it comes and the blues when it comes. And one of my old sort of sayings was, it's heaven and hell every day. And if I get a, a little light as well as the darkness, I'll, I'll go with that. It's taken me 34 years to work that out, you know. And I'm 34 uh, next week or something like that. And I mean, marriage is, is, is no harder to be happy at than anything else. It's the same as life. So I, I don't really categorize it into mm -hmm. marriage, career, or anything like that. If I'm happy, I'm happy either married, unmarried, hit record, no hit record. It sort of ha seems to have almost nothing to do with how your social life is going, your happiness. You're an interesting man and uh, already a proven genius in your field. I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you, Howard. So did I. John? See you in the football game, right? Yes, indeed. At halftime in our Monday night booth. Okay. John Lennon has been the guest. The name of the show is Speaking of Everything. Howard Cosell, thank you for listening. <laughs>